Church planting is evangelism on a macro level. Church planting is God's ordained method to bring the kingdom of God to this world, to, to spread the gospel to this world. And so that's what we're part of. And I want to talk about, uh, this, for those of you who are leading churches, those of you who are on staff in churches, those of you who are elder churches, I want to talk to you about having a heart to send out churches, to send out resources, to send out money, to send out leaders. And uh, for those of you that are maybe in different churches, that maybe God would even spark your heart to where you will be called one day to plant a church, maybe four years from now, maybe five years from now, maybe even sooner than that. So what I want to do, open up your Bible to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 1 is where we're going to be. Titus 1, 1 through 5. And once you have it, will you please stand for the reading of God's word? At Living Stones, after we read the word, we all say, thanks be to God. So if you would all, uh, we join in many traditions in doing that. So after I read this, uh, if you would just say with me, thanks be to God. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. And at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we look into this text, as we look into our call, uh, may you give us eyes to see what you're doing in the world. Father, uh, we ask that right now our hearts would be aligned with your heart and that we would hear what you want us to hear so that we could see what you want us to see. Specifically, Lord, as we talk about verse 2 and the covenant of redemption, we know that we're trembling on holy, we're walking on holy ground and that we should tremble uh, when we walk on that holy ground because we're talking about the conversation you have with yourself before the foundation of the world. And so God, give us humility and give us awe as we do that. And God, we ask uh, that you would stir our hearts that there might be revival across the West Coast, across the Western United States. So we pray all this for your glory, and we pray it in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. Okay, here's my point today. Church planting is reaping in history what God planted in eternity. Church planting is reaping in history what God planted in eternity. So we read this text, and I want want to jump around at different parts of this text uh, to kind of explain what I mean by that. Uh, But this is a great church planting text, specifically because of verse 5. Look at verse 5. Paul tells Titus, This is why I left you in Crete, that you might appoint elders in every town, in every city, as I directed you, that you might put what remained in order. So in other words, Paul was part of this process of planting this church on Crete, leaving Titus as the church planter to lead that church, and Titus's job was not done when he planted his church. Titus was also called to appoint elders in every city, every town on the island of Crete, as Paul had directed him. And so uh, the call to Titus is, not, is plant your church, lead your church, appoint elders in your church. 
But when you appoint elders, what you're doing is you're appointing people who are going to lead other people. You're appointing leaders who are going to lead people to Christ, who are going to start churches. And so go and appoint elders in every town as I directed you, is the call that he gives to him. And so that's our call as well. As we're following in the footsteps of the apostles, as we're in obedience to the Great Commission. If you think about the Great Commission, the Great Commission is go into all the world and make disciples, right, of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them uh, what I've commanded you. And here's the crazy thing about that. When the apostles heard the Great Commission, they instinctually started doing two things, evangelism and planting new churches. Evangelism and planting new churches. So they started going out to people that didn't currently have the gospel and preaching the gospel to them. By the way, church planting is not about gathering people from other churches. Church planting is about evangelistic mission. Okay, so that's important because especially in our tribe, theologically oriented guys, they want to plant a church because they're like, well, there's no gospel churches in my city. You ever heard that? And you know what? That might be true in some places. There might not be churches that preach through the Bible. There might not be churches that teach the gospel. But there likely is. But that's not the reason to plant a church. The reason to plant a church is that so people who don't know Christ can know Christ. So that God can gather his elect. That's why we plant churches. And so uh, they, they did evangelism. And then as they did evangelism in different places, they had gatherings of Christians in these different places that became churches. And so everywhere the apostles went, their strategy for fulfilling the Great Commission was the planting of new churches. And so while there's not a verse in the Bible that says, go and plant new churches, there are verses in the Bible that tell us to make disciples. And when we see the apostles making disciples, they start planting churches. So the the mechanism for making disciples is planting churches. But what I want you to also see from this text is that planting churches is not the ultimate. Planting churches is not the the greatest part. It's not even the goal in the end. Planting churches is a mechanism to get us to the goal, which is the glory of God. So look at verse 2. He says this. Actually, let's read verse 1 too. Paul, servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. We're going to come back to that in a moment. And look at this. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. So that little phrase, promised before the ages began, is powerful. And, And what it's talking about is this. It's talking about The covenant of redemption, as as theologians refer to it, as most Reformed traditions refer to it. But the covenant of redemption is not a covenant that God makes with men. The covenant of redemption is a covenant that God makes with God. It's an inner Trinitarian promise. It says before ages began. could be translated before eternal times. In other words, before there was anything created, before humans were created, before the world was created, there was a promise that was made. And this isn't the only text that talks about it. If I had time, I'd take you to John 17. I would take you to Hebrews chapter 1. I would take you to Luke 22. I would take you to Psalm 110. We could go all over the Bible to talk about the covenant redemption. And we get to peer into this holy interaction that happens between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And this is, this is what basically happens. The Father, we see in John 17, chooses a people, before he even creates, chooses a people that would be his, and he says to the Son, I'm going to give you these people. So the first thing that we should see there is that our salvation and even the work of church planning and evangelism and discipleship it has nothing to do with us. It is rooted in an inner Trinitarian promise. It is rooted in a love gift from the Father to the Son. This isn't about us. This, it's, it didn't originate with us. Our job is to gather what God is calling out from eternity. 
That's our job. And so the father makes a promise to the son, and he gives this people to the son, and he says, son, you must go into their history and redeem them. And we see in John 17 that the son says, I will go and redeem them. I will go and sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. I will go and die on the cross for them. I will go and cleanse them. And then the son... When the son goes to the cross, we see in John 17, he says to the father, okay, father, I've been holding them. Will you hold them while I go to the cross? He goes to the cross. He dies for this elect people, this loved people. And then after he dies, the father gives it back to the son. The son then gives this people to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes this people cleanses this people, applies the work of Christ to them, sanctifies them throughout their journey, and then returns them back to the Son. Now, here's the crazy thing. 1 Corinthians 15, we're told that after everything is wrapped up, after Jesus comes back, all the elect are gathered. Jesus comes back, and he then takes the kingdom and gives it back to the Father. So look, this thing is far beyond us. It's definitely not about us. This thing is about the covenant of redemption. It's about God's eternal purposes. We see this worked out in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, theologically. And we see it worked out in many places in the Bible. But really what is happening here in history is something God planted in eternity. So what we're doing as Acts 29, is being faithful to gathering the people that God has purchased and planned for in eternity past. So this isn't even about church planting. This isn't about us in any way, shape, or form. And you need to know that because church planting is extremely hard. You need to know that, that that it is rooted in these eternal realities, that as you're slugging it away in your church plant and you've got 62 people and then five of them left last week and you don't know what the heck you're going to do and you're frustrated and you're tired, you need to know that what you're doing, those 62 people were redeemed, were planned for in the eternal purposes of God. And that as you're slugging it away, you're fulfilling God's purpose. And God's purpose for you might not be that you ever have a large church. You might not ever have more than 100 people. And that's okay. Because God's purpose for you might be just to gather that portion of his elect that he called out in eternity past. We get confused in church planning when we make it about us. Because we will often make it about our platform our glory. We want people to look at us. We want people to read our blog. We want people to follow us on Twitter. We want to be able to speak at conferences. We want to do all these things, but it's not about that. And if you're making it about that, if that's in your heart, you have to constantly repent of that because this thing is about the covenant of redemption. Okay, so I want to show you a diagram that kind of breaks this out uh, for us. In verse 2, you have the covenant of redemption. In the verse 3, we'll look at this in a second, you have the proclamation of redemption. That's what the preacher, the planter does. In verse 1, you have the process of redemption. That's evangelism and discipleship. And in verse 4 and 5, you have the context of redemption, which is the local church. Okay, so covenant, proclamation, process, the context of redemption. Okay, so now let's look at... Uh, oh, I want to also show you that this, this, uh, this, what I'm talking about here, this covenant of redemption, has been in the confessions of uh, many confessions of the church. It, was, it wasn't in the Westminster Confession, but there, there, there were others that after the Westminster Confession, they talked about this uh, in light of the Westminster Confession. It is in the true and greater Westminster Confession, the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. Uh, so I'm going to throw that up on the screen. This covenant is revealed in the gospel. First of all, to Adam in the promise of salvation by the seed of the woman. 
Look at this. And afterwards, by further steps, until full discovery thereof was completed in the New Testament. And it is founded in that eternal covenant, transaction, that was between the Father and the Son about the redemption of the elect. And it is alone by the grace of this covenant that all the posterity of fallen Adam that ever were saved did obtain life and blessed immorality. Immortality. So this, not immorality. That came from Adam. <laughs> okay, so this, again, this co- I just want to point to the fact that it's all about this eternal covenant. Now look at verse 3. In verse 3 he says this, that this covenant is manifested at its proper time in his word. And it's through the preaching of the word and specifically through the preaching of the gospel that this eternal covenant is manifested. So look, preachers, pastors, leaders, here's your job. Your job is to manifest in history through preaching of the gospel, through preaching of the word, what God planted in eternity. That's your job. You you are to proclaim the glorious gospel that was in the heart of God before the world began. That's our job, that proclamation. But in that, I want you to notice this. It's through preaching the word. And one of the reasons why I am passionate about planting churches with Acts 29, well, I, and there's a sense where, of course, all church planting at, at, at some level is great, but I am specifically passionate about planting Acts 29 churches is because I want there to be, and I hope you want there to be, and we should want, according to this verse, churches that preach the Bible. Uh, we have lots of churches that preach a verse from the Bible and then they just talk about stuff. We don't need any more of that, okay? We need churches that preach the word of God and the gospel of God, unashamed. The, the Roman Empire, think about this, was changed through the faithful preaching of the gospel and the faithful preaching of the word. And we, you had these gritty people They were willing to risk everything for this gospel, everything for this word. And the whole Roman Empire was completely changed by that. And the gospel spread not only through the Roman Empire, but through Europe and came over to the States. And it's in all parts of the world. It's all, all, now it's in South America and China. It, It is in Africa. It's spreading like wildfire. But the kind of churches that actually have historical sustainability, that actually make a difference long term, are churches that preach God's word and the gospel of God from God's word. And so what we need to do is not just plant churches. We need to plant Bible preaching, gospel centered churches. That's what we're trying to do. So We need, I just want to get this down. You might jot this down for your own thinking. We need gospel-centered, culturally engaged, Bible-preaching, discipleship-oriented, evangelistic churches. That's what we need. And that's what we're trying to do in Acts 29 West. That's what we're trying to do in Acts 29 Global, is to plant those kinds of churches. Okay? Okay, so I want you to see word, preaching, and that this eternal covenant of redemption is manifested through the word. Now look at verse 1. He says this, Paul, a servant of God. Interesting there, that when Paul introduces himself, and he does this in other places too, that he doesn't introduce himself always as, as the apostle. Many times he introduces himself as a servant. If you're going to be participating in church planning, you have to be a servant. You, you cannot be the kind of person that wants to build something for your own glory. You have to be somebody who is willing to serve, willing to give, willing to push things out, push things away from yourself, and give and give and give. That's how we're going to see uh, the movement spread. That's how the movement is always spread. It's through servants. And you have Paul who's saying, I'm a servant. And if you look at his life, that's what he did. He went around and served this covenant of redemption. He went around and served this mission, the Great Commission, by serving church planters, equipping church planters, going to the next city, getting beaten in some cities. I want to be the kind of uh, Calvinist that Paul was. Paul was a Calvinist, by the way. 
The kind of, this is the kind of Calvinist he was. He would go into the city, preach the gospel. They would throw rocks at him until they thought he was dead. He'd be laying there dead. They'd drag him outside the city, leave him for dead. He would awaken hours later and go back into that city and keep preaching the gospel. I don't want to be the kind of Calvinist that would say, well, God will save them. I'm going to the next city, right? I want to be the kind of Calvinist that is willing to rescue, uh, to give myself to the rescue of God at the cost of myself, a servant, as he says he is. And then he says this, Paul, servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and here, here's what we're doing. This is discipleship. Uh, this is evangelism and then discipleship. Look at this. For the sake of the faith of God's elect. That's evangelism. Everything that we're doing, we're doing for the sake of the faith of God's elect. The, the, the faith, so there's many elect people in Reno. Our job is to go out and find those people, preach the gospel to every creature, and tell the elect to start coming in. And we have to believe, and this is the way we need to approach it. If, I, I usually think of it this way. If you're, in, if you're my neighbor, you're supposed to get saved. If I'm in a relationship with you, you're supposed to get saved. Because I don't know everybody in Reno, but I know you. So you must be one of the ones God has called out from eternity past. And so you're going to get saved. And that, that is the work of evangelism. But then, uh, look at this. He says, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. So there's two components of discipleship there. Knowledge of the truth and godliness. That, that is the outworking of the truth in a pious life. Okay? So you have uh, knowledge of the truth first. We need to plant churches where people can have knowledge of the truth, where the Bible is exposed, okay? Where, where, the, where we preach the 66 books of the Bible, where the main diet of the church is expository preaching. Those are the kind of churches that we need to plant. The expository preaching that is culturally relevant, expository preaching that is gospel-centered, but we, our job is to expose the Bible. We're supposed to, discipleship is about bringing the knowledge of the truth to people. And the truth is found in the word of God. So it's not found in just good principles. It's not found in little life lessons. And so we, what we need to do is plant the kind of churches that do that. Expose people to the knowledge of the truth. And then also bring people to wisdom in their life, to piety in their life, to the seeking of God, holiness, life, a life of prayer, a life where they seek God with all of their heart. Those are the kind of churches that we desire to plant in Acts 29. All right, now let's go to verse 4. Church planting is relational. I want you to see this in verse 4. To Titus, my true child in a common faith. So there's a few things there. He, he sees Titus as his true child in the faith. In other words, he led him to Christ, but he's been in relationship with him. And when he addresses him, he addresses him in a relational way. So the way that church ha planning happens is through discipleship in our churches, evangelism, then discipleship in our churches, and the maintaining of relationships in our churches. Even as you see Paul on his missionary journeys, you see what he does? He goes out, he plants these churches, he travels around, plants more churches, and then what does he do? He circles back to all those churches because he maintains relationship with them. And that's also the way we're going to know a man's character. That's also the way we're going to be equipping them is through relationships. So we're not just uh, planting churches like a machine. We're not just like some kind of uh, machinery. We're just, you know, pushing them out. But we're planting churches in ways where we know each other. We love each other. We pray for each other. And we're rooting for each other. Even if we're in the same city, we're rooting for each other. Okay? Well, we want to help each other see the kingdom of God advance because we're in relationship with one another. And then in verse 5, we already looked at that. He, he talks about appointing elders in every city. And you guys know, uh, if you read the rest of the chapter, it gives all the qualifications for the kind of character that those uh, men need to have. And so we see kind of uh, not only is he supposed to plant that church, he's supposed to plant multiple churches by appointing elders in all the different churches, which was common theme in the book of Acts. Matt Dirks referred to it uh, earlier, that you see this refrain throughout the book of Acts that the church kept growing, the church keeps multiplying, the church keeps advancing. And then the, the way that it keeps advancing is through the planting of new churches. And I'm sure some of them were very small churches, some of them were very big churches. We need all churches to advance this mission. 
So look at this in Acts 9.31 up on the screen. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. So that's the discipleship element is being built up. And it's walking in the fear of the Lord. So there is this holy joy and fear in God, this awe and reverence. By the way, the kind of churches we want to plant are churches that have awe and reverence for the holy God. Okay? The fear of the Lord. And look at this. And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So Reformed guys are known for their fear of God, but we're not known for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Let it be that in Acts 29, we're known for awe and reverence, but we're also known for comfort and humility as God's people. That we're advancing his kingdom humbly and prayerfully and by the power of the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And look what happens. When they did that, it multiplied. Okay? It multiplied. Now, you probably know these next two quotes, but I want to review them in light of uh, talking about multiplication. Uh, Peter Wagner. This is a great quote. He's a missiologist, and he says this. Planting new churches is the most effective evangelistic methodology known under heaven. In other words, if you really want to advance God's kingdom, if you want to reach people that don't currently go to church, or or more importantly, people that are not currently saved, people that are not currently regenerate, if you want to bring the gospel to them, it's going to happen through the planting of new churches. And that's not just because he said it, not just because his research says that, it is also because we know throughout the history of the church, on every continent in this world, church planting has been the way that God has done this. Okay, And then, of course, Yoda, Tim Keller, says this. <laughs> the vigorous, continual planting of new congregations is the single most crucial strategy for, one, the numerical growth of the body of Christ in any city, and two, the continual corporate renewal and revival of existing churches in a city. Nothing else, not crusades, outreach programs, parachurch ministries, growing mega churches, congregational consulting, nor church renewal processes will have the consistent impact of dynamic, extensive church planting. This is an eyebrow-raising statement, but to those who have done any study at all, It is not even controversial. uh, We must be committed to church planting. All these other ministries that are out there are great, and they can be effective, and they can come alongside the church. But look, our primary emphasis needs to be the planting of new churches. Not only because it is practical, pragmatic, most effective, but because theologically that is how the covenant of redemption has always been fulfilled. The gathering of God's people has always been fulfilled. This is how the kingdom has always advanced. The the disciples, the, the apostles instinctively obeyed the Great Commission by the planting of new churches, not by the starting of programs, not by you know, holding a big concert and inviting the city to it. It's by starting new churches. So that's why we're passionate about doing this in Acts 29. So in light of that, if you want to be committed to the starting of new churches, I want to talk practically about what you will need to do as a lead pastor, as a staff member, as a prospective church planter, as somebody, maybe you're just a member of a church. Uh, How can you contribute? How can you be part of it? Okay, first thing. You have to have a heart for planting. Okay, you have to have, this has to come into your heart. If you don't have a heart for planting, I don't know what to say. Maybe study the word, study church history, uh, you know, look into church planting movements historically. Uh, but probably the most important thing is pray until your heart is set aflame by the local church, that it is the hope of the world, that this is the way that God is advancing his kingdom. That the local church, with all of its flaws and, and, and all the problems that happen in local churches and all the issues that arise, is still the body of Christ. That the local church, um, even though it's a painful place to be, 
it's a hard place to be, is still more beautiful than anything else in this world. That the, like Augustine said, the church is a whore, but it is my mother. Right? It, it is. All throughout the Bible, we're told that the church is a whore. It's always running to other lovers. And if you're a pastor, you know they're always running to other lovers. That's why you have to expose them to the great God so that they will be humbled by his greatness and run to him. Okay, so you have to have a heart for planting. Um, look, this is what I, I really, really believe this. You can plant a lot of churches if you don't care who gets the credit. Now, if you do care who gets the credit, you probably won't plant many churches. You might be able to plant your church, but I doubt it will be healthy if it's about you. But if you don't care who gets the credit, you can plant a lot of churches. And so we pray. We ask God. We expect God to move. We expect God to raise up church planters. We expect God to raise up some of these people that we're discipling. If I had an apple with me right now and I said, hey, look at this apple. What do you see? You all would say, well, an apple. Oh, well, it's a red apple and it's got this color. You might say all kinds of different things about the apple. But what if I said, okay, now look at this apple. What do you see? Look deeper. Think about the apple. The apple has inside of it what? Seeds. And those seeds could plant many trees. And those trees could have thousands of apples. Pastors, don't just see your church as, oh, I got a disciple care for these people. See your church as seeds that are going to plant thousands of churches. That there is a legacy going all the way back to the apostles, going all the way back to Jerusalem and the planting of new congregations. It started with one seed. It started with one tree and that tree became more and more and more and that's how it spread throughout the world. And so you have to come with the expectation that God is going to do that. And you ask him to do that. You pray that he will do that. You're on your knees asking he would do that. You're fasting so that he would do that. It's not for your glory at all. It's going to mean sending out, pushing out. But in the, at the end of the day, it's about God's glory and it's about the covenant of redemption, the, the triune relationship, the celebration of the love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the, get, the love gift of the church, all of these glorious realities. See, we are planting in history what God has planted in eternity. We're reaping the benefits of what he's planted in eternity. Okay, so now, Jesus says, where your treasure is, what? If you're not giving money to church planting, you don't care about church planting. I don't care what you say with your mouth. Right? Jesus said, where your treasure, there your heart would be also. You say, oh man, I'm so like, we believe in church planting. Give money to church planting then. Okay? I'm talking about you set aside, we say in Acts 29, we covenant together, we give 10% to church planting, no matter what. Some of you are keeping that covenant, some of you are not keeping that covenant. If you're not, I would humbly ask you to repent and care not just with your words, but with your money. Because the way that we're going to advance this thing is through lots of money given to church planting, right? It takes a lot of money to plant a lot of churches. And you know this just in your church. You have people that go to church and say, oh, we believe in the vision. We love this church, but they don't give money to the church. Well, in Acts 29, sometimes we have guys that say, hey, I believe in church planting. I'm all about church planting, but they don't give money to church planting. Give away at least 10%. I would even say, and this is what we do at Living Stones, we give away 10% to church planting, and then anything else we give away to mercy ministries, to city ministries, is an offering above and beyond the tithe we give to church planting. So we operate probably on about 86% of our income. Give money to church planting. So a heart for church planting. Next, a head for church planting. Um, you are giving a vision. You were talking to leaders about church planting. You're constantly dropping it in your sermons. You're do dropping it into leadership meetings. You're, you're thinking ahead. You're preparing for church planting. You're sending 
uh, the, your best guys out. But before you send them out, you're training them up. You're encouraging them to go ahead and go out. Um, so let me give you uh, a couple of things here. Um, one, if you want to put some feet to this, if you want to put some hands to this, invest in a church planning network. In the modern day, that's probably the best way to do it. Invest in a church planning network, be part of a church planning network, attend church planning events, encourage church planters, give money to church planters, and be willing to, through that network to send out church planters. And to, do, to give you kind of just some practical tools, I just want to walk through a few things that we've done at Living Stones to get you thinking about what you could possibly do. This isn't about Living Stones. This isn't about you know, what we've done. It's just to give you some practical tools so you can think about what you've done. Obviously, we planted this Reno church. And we decided we were going to plant this Reno church to be an evangelistic, missional community in the heart of the city that preaches the Bible, that preaches theology. And, and through that, and we, just, and we decided we're going to be in the city for the city. So we're here to serve the city. And that's going to be our missional strategy for evangelism, is serving the city, creating relationships with people in the city, and then leading those people to God. So we planted this church. But at some point, we had to make a decision uh, because the church grew. Are we going to just keep growing at a, as a church or are we going to send out? So in the early days, we started with a multi-site strategy. And over time, we have taken that multi-site strategy. And instead of being uh, a multi-site strategy that is kind of like with one thing at the top going down to the locations, we decided that wasn't us. I'm not against. If you're doing that, uh, praise be to God. But that's not what we wanted to do. We decided what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a network of churches. So our Living Stones churches uh, are churches that have their own leader, their own preacher, their own elders. Uh, and then those churches hopefully will also plant out churches is our hope. Okay, so I want to tell you about the process that we had to, to get there. First thing, we did, first thing we did is we planted a church in Sparks. We planted with Kyle Bateson. I'm going to throw that up on the screen. He planted the church in Sparks. And the way that we did that is we had some community groups. People were driving 20, 25 minutes to come to our church. Uh, Kyle had started a community group. And then we had another community group. And there started to be a multiplication of community groups. I think there was three or four community groups. And at that time, I met with Kyle. He had no interest in being a pastor, but he was planting groups. And so he's multiplying. He's raising up disciples, sending them out, planting these different groups. So I met with Kyle, and I'm like, dude... Uh, you're supposed to be a pastor. He's like, no, no. And he told me his whole plan of what he was going to do. And I said, no, dude, I'm telling you, you're supposed to be a pastor. You're, so you're multiplying already. And so he went and prayed about it. He talked to his wife about it. She was like, you were supposed to be a pastor. And uh, long and short of it is, he becomes a pastor. He's a fantastic preacher, an amazing leader. Uh, and he is, uh, his church is thriving, is growing. But I want you to see how we did it. We started with community groups so that we had a multiplying DNA, and we had a missional DNA, and we had a community DNA. And those community groups formed into a church eventually. Another one that we had is in Elko, Nevada, four hours from here. They, uh, Nathan went here for a little while to the Reno church. He called me. He said, hey, I, I, need, uh, I need some help. We're starting a church and, uh, and, you know, people are gathering. And at that time, what they were doing, uh, we were still in the multi-site strategy, but he didn't even know about that. What they were doing is they were taking the sermons from here, and they were getting together and listening to them, and some of his friends were getting saved. So eventually, they started using our videos, and then over time, it transitioned to where we started to train Nathan so that he could preach and lead that church. And that church there in Elko, glory be to God, is over 500 people. It is the largest church in the history of the city of Elko. Okay? And, but the investment on our part was this. We, we said, we will equip Nathan, we will resource Nathan, we will help Nathan, we will take a financial loss for a season so that Nathan can get this thing rolling. Okay? It was all about giving and sending. Uh, then we had Fred Kingman, who started the church in Carson City. He, he was working down in Carson City, 35 minutes from here, and... Um, he, he was, since he was working down there, he's like, I'm just going to move down there and I'm going to start a group. And we we're like, oh, that's awesome, Fred, do it. Because we had some people coming from Carson City. Well, he started that group and he said, I think I want to start a Living Stones church here. And we we're like, okay, we'll see. And he, and he started another group. 
They started a third group. By the time he had four groups, we were like, all right, man. All right, you're doing it. And we uh, trained him, resourced him, sent him out. Uh, we, we financially sponsored the whole thing, and we got a church going there in Carson City. And the crazy thing is now that church in Carson City is hoping to plant another 20, 30 minutes down the road from them uh, with Luke Gorkow. And so the, he's part of the Carson City Church now, and our hope is maybe in the next couple of years we'll send Luke Workout out so that he will plant as well another Living Stones Church. But we not only just plant Living Stones Churches. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, well, this is another hopeful. We'll have a, this is a Living Stones Church we hope to plant in South Reno. The, I can't tell you the guy's name because he hasn't quit his job yet. But... Uh, <laughs> He's going to. He's going to come on staff for two years, do our residency, and then we're going to send him out the third year, hopefully with a few hundred people. All right, let's go to the next one. This is Rick Reeves. Rick Reeves served here on our staff. When I first met Rick, he came and talked to me. He said, I want to plant a church one day. I said, well, plant a community group then. He planted a community group, and out of that community group, it multiplied into several different community groups. I was like, all right, this guy's good. He can plant a church. So I said, all right, come on our staff and we'll train you. He came on our staff, he served in family ministry for a little while, and he went through our church plant residency, and now he's moved to Bend, Oregon, he started Gospel Community Church up in Bend, Oregon, okay? But, and, and right now, we're funding him for the last couple of years at a really high rate so that him and his, church, his family can get this thing off the ground. So it takes a lot of sending, it takes a lot of investing in leaders, it takes a lot of funding. Rick also went through things like our preaching school, pastor school, and like I said, church planning residency. Let me go to the next slide. This is Bobby Grossi. He was an elder here at the Reno Church for a long time. He served faithfully here. He actually, when we were a multi-site strategy, he led the Reno Church here. He went out of ministry for the last year, and now he will be replanting a church in uh, Galetta, California, near Santa Barbara. And uh, so praise be to God for that as well. So, and we're going to resource him. He's been trained. We're going to resource him. We're going to help him. We're going to fund him. We're going to give him whatever he needs to do that. All right, I think that was, that was it. The last thing I want to say is this. We, there's one more. Oh, yeah, David Jin. Sorry, David. Yeah, so David has been part of our church, <laughs> church planning residency for the last couple of years. He moved here from Seattle to do our church planning residency, and he's finishing it up. He's going to be moving to Seattle pretty soon. He is going to join a local church there. He's already in communication with a local church there. The Seattle guys, please uh, take time to meet David if you don't already know him. He's, he's going to be joining that local church there, be sent out from that local church, and then we will begin uh, uh, supporting him financially. We will be behind him 100%. I, I'm giving you all these examples to show you all the different types of plants there can be, to, to show you, just to give you a vision and a heart of what you might be able to do that can go way beyond just your church. And I want to say this just as a last word on all this before I wrap up. We have guys on our current staff right now that I am confident could plant churches. Kyle Wetzler, and at several of our pastors. I, I am confident they could go and plant the, a church. But what they have decided to do, at least for this period of time, is to stay here with me, lead this church so that we can plant many churches. Okay? So there's also some of you, you won't be called to plant a church. Some of you will be called to contribute to a church that is a church planting church so that you can be part of a bigger kingdom. Okay? And for some of them, there might be more glory for them if they went and planted a church, right? But to be here and to be part of this and to be part of the sending, equipping culture, we're going to see greater dividends for the kingdom. We're going to see more people come in and we're, all, we're going to be part of what God planted in eternity. So I want to throw this, uh, that diagram back up. Oh, yeah. Check this out. If we all were to plant churches... I'm running out of time, so I'm getting a little flustered. I'm out of time. Okay. Um, if we all plan, so this is all of our churches. If we can go to the next slide. That's, that's our churches in Acts 29 West. Now, what if we, in the next few years, we all planted, let's say, another 50 churches? And then what if we planted another 50 churches? And then if we planted another 50 churches? And each one of these churches, were not just a church, but is a Bible preaching, gospel Centered sending church. 
This is what our, the West Coast could look at like. And that's only Acts 29. There are obviously other great denominations and church networks that are doing great work. But this is what we could do together if we all had this vision to be ascending culture. So I want to end again with the covenant of redemption, and we'll wrap this up. You notice the covenant of redemption, going to the proclamation of redemption, to the process of redemption, to the context of redemption. What I want you to see is this. In the planting of our churches, in the, plant, in the sending out, it's the context of redemption, where the process of redemption, evangelism and discipleship happens, that comes from the proclamation of redemption, the preaching of the Bible, the preaching of the gospel, all goes back to the eternal covenant of redemption. One day, we're going to be in the eternal reality, new heavens, new earth. And there's going to be one day where 1 Corinthians 15 is going to be fulfilled. And I have to believe that we'll be able to be witnesses of this great event. When the Son, after having cleansed the church, given the church to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit filled the church so that the church could be sent to go do its work. All the elect are gathered in. All the elect have been sanctified. All the elect have been justified. All the elect have given glory to Jesus as their king. They're, and then we're part of this great kingdom. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that the Son is going to give back to the Father this kingdom. And that kingdom is us. It's the churches we plant. It's the elect that we help bring in. And at the end of the day, God gets all the glory because God does the justifying. God does the saving. God does the regeneration. God did the electing. God's going to do the glorifying. But in some mysterious, crazy way, we get to be part of it by planting new churches. We are reaping in history what God has planted in eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for the men and women who are here. I pray that they would have a vision for church planting that goes beyond just this world, but it goes, it's rooted back in the eternal covenant of redemption. God, I pray that uh, you would call out church planters at this conference that you would encourage ch current church planters that as it is extremely hard, that they would look back to the covenant of redemption. I pray that you would encourage lead pastors of churches to be sending churches. God, ignite our hearts, and by your grace, bring us revival. We pray it in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.